so we have to kind of get uh, All right, so we're good here? Yeah, we're good. Okay, so thanks everyone for coming out tonight. This is actually a really big turnout considering this is the first time we've done CSS. Um, and uh, fantastic turnout, so thank you for coming out. Uh, I'd argue that uh, if we want to continue doing CSS, we'll find a way to do it. Um, we can add this, uh, there's some creative ways for us to uh, maybe slot this in. So if we see the demand in the community, obviously we want to be a part of it. Um, kind of my stock speech that I always get up here and, and talk about is um, you see all the people sitting out here who want to learn about CSS. Uh, if you know something about CSS, if you use CSS, if you're interested in learning it, get up here and give a talk. It's a really great way, <coughs> it's a really great way to not only learn it, uh, put, uh, put it into practice, but also to be a larger part of the community. Um, so, and we've got three speakers tonight, so really cool folks. Uh, one of our own, uh, Chris McLean, is gonna be speaking tonight, who's right over here. He works here at CloudSpace. And for those of you who don't know anything about CloudSpace, we are a web and mobile developer. So uh, keep us in mind if you ever uh, have a need for any of those things or want to work for a really cool company. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Caitlin and she'll give you all the rest of the details. Okay. So I will be bugging you guys. I'm sorry. It'll probably be through Meetup. That way I can reach the larger span than who's actually here on like feedback on whether or not you think that this is something that we need to invest more time into and adding this to the typical rotation, and I'll figure it out. Um, so I will be doing that probably this week, maybe if not next week. Um, also, to random note, Tech Week's coming up. I know if any of you guys have been a part of it in October, April's going to be a normal thing. They're not going to try to do this twice a year. So April's going to be like the typical time that they do it. It ends with bar camp, and hey, look at you. You're wearing a bar camp shirt from last year. Uh, so it's going to be pretty awesome. The tea party itself I'm really excited for because it's at Dr. Phillips. It is in the big glass second story hall. It's going to be amazing. And you get to wear either really cool bow ties or ties or really cool t-shirts. They're expanding it a little bit since it's at the D-Pack. But that's awesome. Right in the middle of Tech Week happens to be our JavaScript meetup. This meetup is not going to be our typical meetup, as we have two women speakers for JavaScript. It's going to be amazing. It's a rare thing to actually get women to come up here and speak, let alone a full panel of women speaking. And Mike over here decided a month ago to drop the ball on me in front of an entire meetup group that I'm going to be learning JavaScript and giving a talk. <laughs> so, by the way, I'm building something currently, right now, as we speak. Yeah. Um, and that's happening in two, three weeks. Oh my God, I just threw up a little bit. Um, that will be pretty crazy. Please RSVP, that way we can kind of figure out. We may do, s I, we're still planning this one out. It's going to be a big ordeal. The sad part is. And I have to apologize for it, just in case anybody's watching. It is on the same day as Starter Studio's demo day, which poor Daniel can't make it out. Because of Fat Merchant. Is it your own company or Fat Merchant? Fat Merchant. Fat Merchant, which is one of my favorite startups, by the way. I love them. So I would love for you guys to make it out. Obviously, it's a rare thing. It just so happens it just landed on my busiest meetup day. But I'm not going to hate you if you decide to go to demo day instead. But it has to be between the two. Don't just bail. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that being said, let's get this rolling. And Christian, you ready to go, Maddie? Yes, I'm ready. So do I have to wear this? Yes, you do. Right. It's for YouTube. All right, thank you. Everybody on YouTube gets to watch you. That doesn't make you feel like you're here. All right. <laughs> Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Christian. I um, am, a f am a front end developer for uh, Westgate Resorts. Um, all right, so uh, my talk today is going to be about a framework um, called Foundation. And um, how many people here have ever heard of Foundation? Yeah. Wow, that's pretty surprising. Uh, 
and the other one obviously is bootstrap. Those are like the two biggest that you hear from. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to go through, highlight some points and differences, uh, kind of talk about what the framework does in general, um, and then we can see some code examples, and then um, we'll go into some other talks about some other different topics. All right, so um, <coughs> Zurb Foundation, uh, that's the um, people that um, create and make foundation and maintain it. I think they have about three people uh, that work on foundation full time, so um, it's constantly updated and it, it will constantly, I think the next iteration, uh, foundation six, will have some Angular baked into it, so uh, keep a lookout for that. <coughs> um, foundation versus bootstrap. Um, basically, if you're ever sort of wondering what the differences are between Foundation and Bootstrap, uh, I put up here creating a custom design versus overriding predefined styling. Um, essentially means is that uh, how many people, um, your job is you get a PSD and you have to recreate that, right? It, that's my job. So if that's your job, you don't want to sit there and be restyling the whole entire CSS framework uh, to sort of get the end result of what you need. Um, in that particular sense, that's the core difference between um, foundation and bootstrap. Uh, foundation is the styling sort of left up to you. Uh, what you can do with it is sort of left up to you, where bootstrap is more uh, great for prototyping. I always say that back-end developers, it's great for them because they don't have to think about design. Plug in a button, looks like a button, and you're, you know, you're moving along. So that's some of the core differences. Um, foundation has a mobile first uh, philosophy. Um, so everything is designed from the ground up to be <coughs> in mobile. And what does that mean exactly? Um, if you're on a mobile device like a phone, um, that's going to be like small equals 12 as far as the grid system goes, the column system. Um, unless you want something to be different, like if you want large to be three or four, uh, to split things up between three or four columns, um, then you describe it in the grid system that way. So it's a mobile first design. Um, <coughs> it also uses, uh, Foundation uses REMs instead of pixels. Um, that's a difference too. Um, does anybody know the difference between REM and pixel and EMs and things like that? No, that's really boring stuff. Uh, but essentially what it is, it allows uh, you to resize uh, the font size um, where <coughs> pixels, uh, if you're for example, if you're on IE, which I'm on right now, probably nobody here uses IE. Uh, but if you are, when it makes things bigger, it makes everything bigger. It's not really making the font actually bigger, where REM is actually directing it to, to create a larger font. So stuff like that. Um, it uses, it comes with a bide validation. It's a JavaScript library. Um, when, you're, when you're creating forms, uh, how many people here use WordPress? A lot. I hate WordPress. It gets hacked all the time, right? So WordPress, uh, are anybody here RS Forms? No, it's like a plugin that you can create forms. Um, with Foundation, when you create, you can create your own forms, you can use your own validation for like, uh, you typed in something wrong, you didn't put in a date, or you didn't put in a number, um, it'll give you those validation rules in there, so it uses abide validation, which is pretty cool. And my point to the forms thing is, when you make your own form, um, you'll never want to go back to using like plugins or things like that. It's just better to create your own stuff. Um, so that really helps out. <laughs> Interchange, which is uh, basically uh, on your responsive design, you can actually exchange out some, um, uh, some dynamic content like pictures or whatever. So actually upon uh, changing your, uh, your viewport to a different resolution or a different size, uh, you can switch some things out dynamically. Uh, so that's a core difference. Uh, it comes with the navigation, off-canvas navigation. Um, don't generally like to use that. Um, I hope their next iteration they do something a little bit better, but uh, that's their navigation tool. And they also um, have a lot of templates to get started. So if you aren't really familiar with that, uh, you can go to their website and get started with their templates, which is pretty easy. Um, so um, in <coughs> difference, Bootstrap uses pixels. Uh, it has re some responsive embeds. And um, there's a lot of completely styled themes. So I included some videos in here. Oh, by the way, this is a Sway presentation. It's like a PowerPoint online type of thing. So when I give the link to this, like all this stuff has links in it, videos, all that. You can use it as a resource. So 
<clears throat> um, anybody hear of Atomic Design by Brad Frost? You heard of it? Um, so what essentially Atomic Design is, um, it's really trying to uh, take web design and bring it to uh, a very elemental basis and then work its way up to like templates and or I should say modules and then templates and then pages of information, right? Um, and the reason why um, when we get into the SAS and um, talk about foundation and why that's good to use, uh, what's important about this or what the point of this is, is that when you organize your CSS or your SAS really well, when it's really organized, um, it's a lot easier to go in and think about changes that need to be done um, later on or <coughs> adjustments that need to happen later on or just uh, sort of taking what you might have done with like a button or a, a widget, you know, or whatever, and sort of configuring that to something different. Um, if you've ever done a project for a client <laughs> and you finish that project um, and they say, go back and can you make this, you know, round or can you give this a border radius or whatever, if you've done all your CSS, just blanket CSS, uh, it, it might be a little bit hard to go wade through uh, what's in there. So when you organize your stuff really well, um, and I'll show you like how Foundation does that with SAS, uh, it's a lot easier to get a, get a hold of. So <laughs> I just included this. Um, uh, Brad Frost, there's links to this stuff. He says, we're not designing pages, we're designing systems of components. So that's the kind of the idea. Um, took a period, made a bunch of HTML elements in there. Um, I agree with most of this, except for organisms. <laughs> Uh, you're not really making organisms, but uh, atoms are just your basic inputs. So you have label, input, button. Those are all just fundamental, you know, uh, parts of using CSS and HTML. Um, and then here, molecules are when you start to put that stuff together, right? <coughs> and then from there, you create your organisms or templates uh, to give you different parts and pieces of your, your, your page, right? So the next thing, um, and I know Chris's talk next is going to be about less and some um, uh, grid systems and things like that. Um, mine's going to be about SAS and just kind of the differences. Uh, does anybody here have a preference for less versus SAS? How about SAS versus less? It's going to do the same thing. It's going to accomplish the same thing for you. Um, I don't write much in CSS at all, really. Um, I use all SAS and, uh, or, or less uh, because it's just the organiz organizational factor of it. Um, so um, just some, uh, there's two really good links there. Is, is everyone familiar with Chris Coyer? He probably is like, if you're not following him, then, you know, he comes up with like, I'll get emails. I think he got bought or got swooped up by like Toots Plus or something. Um, but I get emails every once in a while and um, it has a lot of content from uh, Chris in it for different CSS subjects and his stuff is really always on point and just really good information. Um, so I included two links in there that I found very helpful. Um, and they just basically give you the core differences between less and SAS. <coughs> One of the things about less or about SAS that I like a lot that I use, <coughs> especially for mix-ins, um, are the ability to put in like if statements or while statements, just, just the way almost like regular programming um, that's included in SAS. Uh, SAS does that pretty well. Uh, so if, you're, if you care about any of that stuff, if you're really going to dive deep into it, th there are some core differences. Um, he also, on the right-hand column, it's not as big as I would want it. But let me see if I make it a little bigger. <clears throat> if anything, you can also post your stuff to the comments in the group as well. That's fine. So on the right-hand side there, it, it gives you the SAS uh, style guide. That's a really good link um, to check out on your own. Um, but basically, when you're writing SAS, it gives you kind of like a priority of what you should include where. Um, when you're writing out um, the SAS. He says list extends at first and then list includes. Uh, list your regular styles and then do your nested pseudo classes. And, and then lastly, uh, do your nest 
uh, nested selectors. Um, how many people work with SAS or less on a regular basis? Okay, so you know what this stuff is. I don't have to explain that. Um, includes is where you start to get your mix-ins, um, and we're going to go through a couple mix-ins um, just to show you that stuff. Uh, but extend is basically like if you're using repetitive CSS um, over and over again, you can just sort of extend and then have that in there. Um, bottom padding is 10 or whatever. You can just reuse that over and over again. <coughs> so um, this is a common just set up a foundation here. Uh, one thing that I include that I wrap my stuff in a lot is our sections. I put like backgrounds in there, um, color. Uh, if you want, uh, if you're following a grid system, and this grid system here, I think it starts off at like a thousand, but you want your background to be like a, a blue or red or whatever, uh, you do that in the section uh, tag. Um, and I use section because Basically, if I was column, right column, I'll have left section, right section. It's sort of like a place in my um, markup that tells me like where I'm at. So if you look at it through your console, um, pretty much everything is organized by sections, and that's how I do it. All right? <coughs> so but before we get to the end, I'm going to show you some actual examples. And um, I use... Uh, um, Julian, he has a framework for a foundation. Um, I'm not going to install it here, but basically uh, when I'm compiling my uh, SAS, I'll use libsass. Uh, I'll use uh, Bower and Grunt, and it's like a sort of a whole process uh, that injects Bower dependencies and libraries into your project automatically. So I'll show you guys that. If you're interested, I'll show you exactly how to download it and do it, but uh, we'll check it out. So, um, so this, this is my uh, project folder right here. And all of my bits and pieces, including foundation and all the SAS um, components are, are in there. And if I go here, I'll just show you an example of that. So if I type grunt, it'll go in there and just fire up and it'll have a live reload. So like it'll watch any changes that I'm making and it'll load it right in there. So this is foundation, it's called the kitchen sink. Um, when you download this, it comes in there. If you ever see this, has anyone ever seen this? I don't wanna play this video, but yes. you want me to play it? No. It's 10 minutes of this guy singing bacon pancakes, so. I think it's pretty hilarious. <laughs> um, this page just shows you sort of like all the different things that um, foundation sort of comes with it. That's why they call it the kitchen sink. Um, and again, one of the things that people do a lot with Bootstrap is that they literally get the kitchen sink, right? They just take the CSS file, they link right to it. They never care about like what 95% of the CSS they're not using in it, right? Um, and they don't. Uh, use it any other way. They just sort of link right to the whole CSS file. Um, when you use, and, and Bootstrap has less, I think they have SAS now too. Uh, when you use this stuff, you should only, you should pay attention to what you're actually using and then comment out the stuff that you don't need to use. So, um, all right, so in this demo, basically what I'm going to show you is how to actually uh, write out some SAS and then see like when you compile it, like what the differences are and how foundation is set up and how it works. <clears throat> so in here, these are my Bower components. So when I installed foundation, this is one of the things that got installed, right? So this is foundation. And then you go here to and what comes up are the components, right? Or in the SCSS. Does anybody know the difference between what SAS and SCSS is? You know the difference? Uh, just real quickly, um, SAS is sort of like uh, the TypeScript language without like parentheses or anything in it. And then SCSS is with the brackets and stuff like that. So that's, that's pretty much what the difference is. What's your preference? I use SCSS. 
yeah, I just use that. So here is foundation and then the components, right? Everybody see that pretty well? So there's a ton of them. And like I said, there's a lot in here that you probably wouldn't use or you wouldn't want to use. So what I'll show you is I'll pull up the file that controls all these, and then we'll just comment them out, and we'll show you when you compile your CSS or your SAS, the CSS that gets formulated doesn't have those um, pieces in there anymore. All right? So if I go back here, basically I just have a navigation bar in here, um, and then I have a bunch of panels. I have some buttons here. Uh, there's one special button, and I just want to make the point that this is responsive, right? So the three, pretty much the three grids, um, just like, like the same as Bootstrap, or the grid system is based on um, small, medium, large, right? And so, like I said, with foundation, it starts off at small equals 12, or small 12. Um, if you don't describe that, it just assumes that that's what you're using. If you want to make a change to anything different, then you should do, let's say, you, on your, your media query that's large, you want to say large 6 or large 3, and it's going to give you these differences. So what's this uh, media query right here for large? What would you assume it to be? Four, right? There's four columns, so it's large 4. Um, when I go to medium, that changes. What else do we notice happens? The background what? It goes away, it disappears. Um, so when you're doing responsive design, um, one of the things that you might want to be able to do is, uh, as things get smaller, you might not want that big, pretty background there anymore, right? It doesn't have a purpose, so you might want to get rid of it. Um, so that's what a lot of these you know, frameworks help you do. You just put in that, that class, and it basically gets rid of it when you don't need it anymore. And so that's the smallest one. What else do we notice happens um, when we get a little bit smaller from medium to small? What'd you say? OK, right. The, the, the actual navigation changes. Uh, we get the hamburger menu. And now we can use this in which devices, right? Okay. None of these links work, by the way. <laughs> so when I go in here, just want to show you when I change this grid system out it automatically changes for you, right? But when I want to go and make a CSS change, I'll go into my settings file. So Foundation has a settings um, file. And what that does is it combines all of your components in the formulation of settings so that you can go in individually to certain pieces and change those individual pieces. Now what you'll find is, is that through a lot of different um, you know, projects that you'll do, uh, you want to customize or edit your own pieces or even completely change one of their components. Um, and their buttons component, I'll show you that, I change that a lot uh, because I do different things with buttons that I'm repeatedly doing over and over again. So I want it formulated the way that I want it formulated. <coughs> so one of the things that they have here is um, primary color. to green. So I changed that to purple, right? And everything changes to purple, just with using a SAS variable, OK? One of the things I do, too, that isn't like the common practice here, but it's one of the things that I do, 
is even beyond this setting sheet right here, which is connected to all the other components, um, I create my own style guide. And the reason why I do that is, um, for example, this navigation bar right here, even though it looks like a straight black piece of black, there's like probably 10 different things in there that are describing that same color black. So if I go and change one thing, right, if I go in and change like nav bar background color black, well, then the hover's not changed. So I gotta go and change that. So what I do with the style guide is I'll say navigation color bar. And then in my style guide, I'll replace that in my settings every time there's a color that needs to be changed. And in my style guide, I'll set that to the color. And then that way, when I change one thing, the whole navigation bar changes. So that's one of the things that you have to do sort of on your own to get the most out of, out of this stuff. <coughs> Um, so I wanted to show you that. Um, I'll go back in here and I'll show you. A couple more examples. This is so small, it's really testing my uh, eyesight. So if you notice, I changed um, uh, the color here. I, I told this to be a call out. Um, If you notice here, this button is different than the other buttons. Um, and that was created with a mix-in, right? So that's what I'm going to show you now. Is that good? Yeah. All right, cool. So um, <clears throat> this here is a mix-in that I created, and also I edited the actual mix-in that um, this uses. So this has what's called button two. So, and where I put that is, I put that here in the components. I put that in custom. So if you can see that, there's this custom button and these custom panels that are here. And what that al allowed me to do, if you go check this out, Kind of hard to see, but there's a ton of stuff there, right? <laughs> now, this looks really like right? You wouldn't use all those variables at any given time. But if you want to change something like the background color, you can do that. So you're not going to produce this CSS unless you actually call it. So it's just sitting there and it gets produced in your CSS file, right? But the reason why I edited this mix-in is because when I'm creating buttons, these are things that I constantly come across, so I want those parameters in there, right? So when you go back to here, and where I place this mix-in specifically at, uh, you can see that these are the different parameters of things that you can change like on the fly, right? That's what a mix-in does. So I'm creating this called button adds. You can call it whatever you want, um, button homepage, button module A, button widget, button two, whatever you want to call it. Um, and what I'm able to do is I'm able to define all these different parameters, okay, that I described in my mix-in. So for example, if I want the background color to be yellow, I can do that. 
Uh, one thing that foundation doesn't obviously have in there is um, button bottom border. So everybody knows how like on button styling you have that bottom sort of border that looks like there's a drop shadow or something. Um, I can do a if uh, statement basically telling me whether or not <coughs> I want that there or not. And if I that won't be there anymore, okay? And then once that compiles, it'll change, all right? Um, the last thing that I'll show you so that you can see where all these things are um, located. Um, I, like I say, I use Julian's generator. Um, I have a link for that in the slides. Um, what his generator does, it, puts, it packages up everything that you need. It puts it exactly the way that you need it. So you can start working like right away. Any project that I use, I start that up like right away. Um, <clears throat> If you notice, his, um, there's some files that repeat themselves, um, but the focus, uh, the way the directory is set up, it's watching like both folders. So that's why it works like that. So this is what I meant <coughs> when I said a little bit earlier about organizing and being able to only use the parts and pieces that you need. Um, everything here is controlled in the app.scss file. Um, and Anything that you don't actually want to use or you don't actually need, you can just comment out. And so when you compile that file, um, you're going to have a lot less uh, uh, size um, CSS file in there. Um, usually people at least need the grid um, buttons, things like that. Um, this is my custom one here. Um, these, for me, can get pretty like out of control. Um, I, I can use a lot of these. Um, especially when I use like temp template module components, um, the way I organize my stuff. Um, I have a whole section that's down here of how I basically use, use this stuff. All right, so um, anybody have any questions? Just wanted to give you guys an introduction to how I use Foundation, what it can do, um, and that's about it. I saw that the next version of Foundation, they're going to have classes for Flexbox. Do you think you know, that's kind of going to make a decision occur where it's like, well, do I want to use Flexbox or do I want to use their native grid? Or is it going to be more of just kind of, oh, let me just pull in Flexbox a little bit here and there? Probably to pull in whatever you need here and there, I would imagine. Um, I, like I said, I don't use a lot of that stuff. Um, I can show you a project that I did. Um, one, and one of the things, too, is that like grid systems and all this stuff, you can really build on your own. I think the question becomes um, when do you use other people's stuff and when do you want to sort of build your own stuff and use your own thing? Um, for me, it's I trust Foundation, what they give me as far as you know their grid system and how they uh, <coughs> present their code. There's, of all the mix-ins that I've gone through, I probably fixed like a ton of their stuff. I'm like, when you do this, this doesn't work this way. You need to do this. And they'll say like, do a pull request, do a get request. Because a lot of people probably don't really use the mix-ins <laughs> in certain ways. Um, but the more you work with this stuff, the more you'll just do a lot more of your own, your own thing. Um, but it's a, but it's, a, it's a great sort of like boost forward to help you get going, that's for sure. Any other questions? So you said you're like you 
you'd make your own custom like style guides. Mm -hmm. um, so you're putting those in like your own separate SAS file and not modifying the default like foundation settings. Right? Yeah, I don't modify the default um, foundation settings like at all. Okay. Um, but sometimes I do, <laughs> and I don't. It does. It's not a. <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me, uh, that's a huge contradiction, right? I try not to uh, change the default at all. Um, but you get in there where a lot of the global settings, like for example, um, to change the color of the global type, <laughs> you know, like I had to go in and actually change that because it wouldn't let me do it any other way. Um, but yeah, some stuff you have to, but usually you don't, you don't have to change that at all. I feel like a lot of the times when you're using foundation or even like bootstrap, you just end up overriding stuff because their default styles are not what you want. So, I mean, at what point do you kind of say, well, I've commented out everything except the grid, so why don't I just bring in like pure CSS or, you know, a different framework that's just a grid or even like a SAS, you know, framework just for the grid? You know, why would you need um, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, this is a project that I did and this is all the stuff that I commented out, right? Like I, I just wasn't using any of that stuff. Um, big project. And then this was all of like my, um, custom stuff like here, right? And I guess the answer or the, the best way to answer that question is, is that the, one of the core differences between foundation and bootstrap is that with foundation you're really not overriding a lot and the mix-ins are really really helpful because the mix-ins give you exactly what you could need like like for a button for example if you want that button background to be different you describe it differently if you want it to be you know have a radius you have a radius if you want a small button a large button a medium button Everything you could want with a button is there. Now, one of the specialized components that I made was a button because it didn't do everything I needed it to do. But the, the jump off point where it got me started was good enough. And for me, that's, that's what I do, is I take the out of it that I need and then I edit the mix in to, to get exactly what I need. Because the one thing you don't want to do, and Foundation does this really well, <coughs> is that you don't want, you have to be careful with SAS files because you can repeat code a lot. You can have the repeat it over and over again. So you can get these huge files and you don't know why. And you can usually see that in your console um, because you'll see the same class repeated again, right? Well, with Foundation, um, they use an include parameter um, that prevents that from happening. So um, for a lot of the stuff that I write, I make sure that I set it up the exact same way and just use it like that. Um, but I think someone said too they had a modal um, project where it worked like everybody made a modal pop-up to see like the the least amount of code that you can possibly use to make a modal pop-up and like somebody did it in just a few lines of code and if you look at bootstrap or foundation they're using like tons <laughs> of code so um, you know things get better over time but in general you just have to kind of use it to to, to help you out the best we can, I think. Anybody else? That's it. Are there any frameworks out there that are just the grid system? Well, yeah, he's going to show you just the grid system. That's okay. next. We are working on that next. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great segue. And then there's Bourbon. Anybody hear Bourbon? It's just all mix-ins. There you go. That's also getting talked about. So that's going to get talked about. Oh, you're not talking about bourbon, no. But um, so stuff out there. Uh, when it when you get to the point where you have your framework set up the best it can be, um, and somebody gives you and you can make that thing exactly like the PSD, whatever is working for you is it's good. All right. Cool. Thanks. So, while Chris is plugging in, I was really bad and totally forgot this because when David does his talk, he has code pen swag. So, remember when we used to do the whole hashtag thing? 
Yeah, we're gonna bring that back. Um, so do hashtag university CSS. Keep it entertaining, please. Not highly inappropriate, but entertaining. Anybody who was here for that Ruby meetup, oh my god. Um, it's entertaining, please. Nothing that needs to be censored. Cuss words are fine. Pictures are not. Um, <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Um, oh, you're fine. You can fix it. <laughs> Hashtag <laughs> university CSS. And then in between the two talks, and I've got another plug-in that's going to happen. So, but yeah, university CSS. And then I'll be reviewing it. And then by the time the end of David's talk, I will have picked. So you should be tweeting now. You got two talks to tweet, but I'm just saying. So, all right. Here is Chris. I need the yeah. microphone thingy now. Because yeah. of YouTube. All right. So, uh, just following off of the last uh, couple questions, this entire talk is pretty much just going to be on less and SAS grid systems. Um, Everything in this is going to be less, not because I have a preference of one over the other, but my current project is all in less, and that's basically what I've been writing for the past couple weeks. Um, so I sort of do a lot of things for cloud space, depending on my client. Um, I've been bouncing around between doing JavaScript, Ruby, a lot of less in SaaS work. And I spent a lot of time working with a lot of very talented programmers in very differing programming positions. And something that always sort of comes up is sort of the same problem of grid systems sort of making its way and making all of the markup around it dependent on just that grid system, whether it's bootstrap or whatever. Uh, so I kind of want to, it's been sort of a pet peeve of mine for a while. And I thought I'd take some time to talk about that tonight. So first, just a quick overview if anyone's super new to SAS, LESS, or Stylus, or whatever new preprocessor we have coming out. Basically, some new language it compiles or transpiles, whoever, whatever you want to say, to CSS. Gives you things like nesting, extensions, mixins and functions. Sort of lets you program like you're actually writing in with a programming language, as opposed to just making a giant config. Um, and this is sort of what less looks like. Uh, not too different than SAS, just a few different differences in syntax. And if at any point you guys want me to speed up or slow down, just let me know. So I kind of want to start out just talking about separation of concerns. Because I think gridding, you start to sort of get away from this idea that we want to keep the different components of our website very separate where our markup, we want to be sort of the structure of our information and what the information actually means. You know, a paragraph is a paragraph. A bit of text that is strong is strong. It doesn't really concern itself with how it looks or how it's presented. It's just supposed to represent a information. Styling, we want to be our presentation logic. What makes our buttons blue? What, what makes our little loader animations work? And we want JavaScript to either be our application logic, you know, maybe we build some fancy graphs with some data, uh, or our business logic behind the actual application if you're making something completely split stack in JavaScript only. And um, sort of the older days of, frame of um, grid systems, uh, we sort of started to break out of that, where if you notice here, this is just an example of some bootstrap code. Um, we have our paragraph tags now completely aware of the fact that we want our thing to be three items long or three units long, however that means. And we're starting to get into putting a lot of how our information structure is presented into the markup, which has its own set of problems that we'll talk about as we go. Um, we get some issues with the increased redundancy where now we have know, hundreds of tags throughout your application now having this bootstrappy grid system logic. Uh, not really much extendability here. We can't, unless we use something like a preprocessor, say we want this exact logic, but add these two extra things to it and use that as a standalone class. We don't really have that with some of these older frameworks. Uh, very brittle. 
Uh, we have a very high coupling with our framework if we want to switch out grid systems. We now have a very hard time doing that as we have to go through and we have to edit every single tag to make up for the change in the, in the framework. And really, it looks, so, it, it looks so much like tables. It's, you have a container, you have a row, and each one is a, you could probably switch out P for table data. I mean, you, you have the benefit of not being a table. It's a lot more accessible for things like disability software, but at the end of the day, it's very, very similar where we're sort of mixing our presentation and our information structure. Um, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it away. <laughs> Um, this is better, <laughs> and it's sort—it's just sort of a thing I'm trying to sort of get toward. Um, is it, and really, it's just starting to get away let more away from gridding and more into just basic object-oriented CSS, um, where we treat our selectors as like we would a class, like a, a class in traditional object-oriented programming. Our thing is a thing. Our button is a button. And the markup really shouldn't concern itself very much what it is. I mean, the bottom one says it's large, but what does large mean? We sort of leave it up to ourselves to define what that is in our CSS. And we have complete control over that. So can we stick all the grid stuff in styles? Is it actually possible? Yes, people already are. Um, Boot actually, and it pains me to say bootstrap, but bootstrap less uh, and SAS libraries have mix-in based systems where you can do everything in CSS. Uh, Bourbon and Neat are sort of my favorite. Uh, ThoughtBot did a really, really good job at making um, a really awesome collection of SAS mixins if you're doing any kind of Rails development or Ruby development. Uh, Semantic Grid is a pretty decent standard system. And there's a few others, and this list could go on and on and on as people keep making more grids. I'm sure I missed the dozens more. Um, basic uh, features of some of these systems. Uh, row and column mixins, um, configuration variables. So usually there's some sort of file somewhere that you can edit, you know, your number of rows, your, num your number of columns, how wide something is, maybe add some breakpoints. And again, it keeps all of our gridding stuff out of our markup. It leads to a lot cleaner code, a lot more reusable code, and really reduces down on our dependencies. And it's kind of what? using it might look like, where you might want to have a container class to use somewhere, and you just sort of include the container mixin, and now it's a container. And all of this is basically just pseudocode, uh, because there's so many different grid systems out there. I didn't want to be out of date by the time I presented this. Um, um, so if you want to make something a column, you just include you know column of this number. And because we have SAS or we have less, we can extend off of these things. We can define our gridding logic in one place and have it trickle down throughout the rest of our application. And we really start to get into more traditional object-oriented programming, a lot more reusable code, a lot more extendable code. Wait, did I go? Yeah. Again, it's like treating a class as a real class. Uh, this is probably somewhat of a duplicate slide. But um, everyone with me so far? Right. So a common pattern you can do with this is uh, what I've been talking about already, is this idea of extension gridding, where we sort of have one place, one class, that we sort of include this mix in, and then we extend off of that and to build all these other components that are grid-like. So we want our UL element to be a container. It could just extend off of container if we want whatever bar or foo are to be a container, it extends off container. And if we want to make the change, we want to make an edit to how our entire gridding logic works, we have one little place we edit, and we that just that container class. Uh, another pattern I see brought up a lot is property-based. And it's sort of uh, this pattern where you define a selector and you define other properties off of it that you can mix and match in your code. It looks a little bit more like some of the traditional front-end CSS frameworks that you see, but it lets you sort of mix and match and combine all of these different properties that make up what you want to be presented. So here, it's a good idea maybe to have a small, medium, and large 
property on your card, whatever a card is, you have your default column. And if you want to change how small small is, you can just edit small. If you want to change how big medium is, you can just edit medium. And it all just sort of trickles down from there. So uh, some questions to ask about uh, choosing a grid system. Uh, do you want a full CSS framework with a grid? Uh, do you want a very large collection of tools that are going to sort of design your site for you? Do you want like a prototyping tool? Because uh, those can be very, very useful if you want to get an idea off the ground. So something like Bootstrap would work very well for that. Uh, do you just want a collection of tools? Um, sort of my favorite framework that I've used in the past uh, couple months has been Neat and Bourbon. That's pretty much what they are. Um, it's just a collection of very, very highly reusable mixins that you include in your application. Uh, do you just need a simple grid? Do you need something modular? There's a lot of questions you can sort of ask yourself. Um, I've been using Semantic Grid a little bit. It's just a nice, simple uh, grid system. It's not very, there's not a lot of features to it. But I'm also a very big fan of very, of using very small, simple, and very focused frameworks. If you're a big fan of that, you might want to look into Semantic Grid. Uh, Bourbon and Neat is very good if you want a very, if you want a sort of a suite of tools to work with. Uh, so Bourbon is this collection of SAS mixins, and Neat is a grid system that sort of builds off of those. So uh, there's this sort of child library called Bourbon, and then there's Neat, and uh, I forget the name of the other two, but there's two other frameworks that sort of sit on top of that as well. So if you do any kind of Ruby or Rails development, it's not much more difficult than running gem install Bourbon, gem install Neat and editing a file, and you're sort of good to go. Uh, Bootstrap, although I think it's very full of dependencies and overwriting, it's still a great prototyping tool. It's a very quick way to get something off the ground, and it does have a very nice grid system. And the mix-in grid system is very nice too, just very underused. Um, using this kind of setup kind of helps you avoid refactoring hell. Um, <laughs> And it's something I'm sure everyone in this room has touched at least once. Um, and I'm not talking just WordPress for content management systems. Content management systems will come in all flavors. But you might have an old system that has just tons and tons of, in, of, um, of HTML files that you don't want to have to go in and write all of this custom inline-esque CSS for. Um, legacy web apps with very little templating might be a good case for some of this, where you just have, instead of writing all of this in line, instead of writing more of these very heavy, m like markup heavy grid logic, you just sort of edit a selector and include your CSS. Um, and it's very good for just large web apps in general. And um, again, uh, grid systems can be very easy because they are so tightly coupled up with how you, your information is structured it's very easy for it to make its way into your application and become very dependent on it. So if you wanted, let's say you wanted to switch off of Bootstrap for something else, but all of your markup is now completely flooded with grid logic. Or let's say you're an Angular programmer and you make a lot of directives that you want to be reused across different applications. You wouldn't want a lot of that in your markup. You would want just a common selector people can go edit and go to town with. And and that's actually something we're dealing with now on a project where we need to make a lot of these reusable components that span several different applications. And using something like um, the standards, like one of the standard CSS grid systems just would not work for reusability there because you're forcing departments you've never met to now adopt your standards, which is never really a good thing you want to do. So. Um, Still not happy, happy with anything I've talked about yet. <laughs> uh, you can build grids. Uh, grids aren't actually all that difficult to build out. Um, this looks a little complicated, <laughs> just because how you do looping in less is a little weird. It's a lot more like making a recursive function. Uh, but this generates just a, uh, a very simple grid like you'd see in 
don't know, like 960 grid, if that's still a thing, or maybe something more akin to bootstraps, where it just generates classes for, you know, column dash a number. But um, we can keep going, and less code is even better. So you can write your own mix in grid system with very little logic as well. Um, there's really not a lot to it. If you want to build something as extensive as maybe foundations or bootstraps, yes, this is going to take a lot more work. But if your goal is just to make a very simple grid and have a site act like it has a grid, maybe you might want to rethink using a framework for it if it's not really necessary. I mean, why tie yourself down to something you can't control if it's only 20 or 30 lines of code? Or maybe you're stuck with an old grid. Uh, well, SAS and LESS gives us the ability to extend classes. So there's really nothing stopping us from just taking that selector and extending off of it. Um, this way, if we want to switch our grid system, we just edit our wrapper for our grid, and there's not really much else to edit from there. And again, modular CSS is really awesome. I promise it's awesome. I would suggest giving this a try at some point if you haven't, even if it's just on a small personal project, it'll, it really does show. And uh, get in touch. It's my email, that's my GitHub. And I have a few things I can show you. So um, spun up, uh, oh, it's pretty much the same example from the slides. I think it's actually the same example from the slides verbatim. <laughs> Where I just made a made grid system. I just implement it here in this card selector. But what's kind of neat here is we're basically taking in the number of columns and calculating the width. Of uh, nothing stops you from maybe saying, I want four and a half columns if it wants to update. There we go. Or if we want to switch to 16, this is editing a variable. We're not 16 columns. It's, it's just a lot less overwriting, a lot less editing. And our markup stays relatively clean and easy to maintain as well. Because I mean, ideally this would be in some sort of some sort of framework with templating, so this would like let's say you're in something like Angular or you're using something like Mustache. You could just have one partial for your paragraph or one partial for this section and that's all you edit. Um, does anyone have any questions? something to change at a certain width and you know they give you that add include <coughs> media you know and then whatever you want it to be so I feel like I might not you know I'm not being semantic because I'm having media queries like all throughout my SCSS hmm. um, I mean is that that's a bad habit right it's not you know, um. I don't want to have media queries all over the place it just seems convenient because there's an add include for a media right. query and you can just throw it in when you like right. Got a giant file, media queries everywhere. Yeah, I, I would need to see like what you've done to be honest. But I think as long as your media queries are properly organized along with the component it's describing, you should be okay. But I would really need to see what you're trying to do there. Okay. Which I can take a look after we're done if you want. Um, that ranges from project to project to project. Um, I've never been on a project where it's exactly the same. Um, probably the w one I see come up the most because is the request to use Bootstrap. Um, I'm not a fan of it personally, 
but it's something that's come up in every single discussion that I've ever had with a client. Um, I'm, a, I'm, again, we've used any number. It ranges. Is it? Uh, we, we try to keep it relatively small, at least recently. Um, I would say for the project I'm on now, we try to keep an average of around 40 or 50. Um, our navbar file kind of exploded a little bit, but we have a ton of navbars in that project that are all wildly different. And admit, self-admittedly, that could be broken up. But we try to keep our files relatively small and one less file describing some component in your project. So you have a buttons less file, a navbar less file, a we have an area graph less file. And we try to treat them more just like as a standalone class like you would in any other object oriented language. Um, anything else? Cool. Mike. Oh, Mike. That's yeah, right, I have this thing. I have another shameless plug because you guys are awesome. Unless you should at least spread the word for sure. Thomas, if you would like to Thank speak you. really quickly while you are setting up. Uh, so my name is Thomas. Uh, we own a branding and design studio here called Move to Create. Uh, we're kind of uh, stretching our capacity to where we are. I have experience in coding. I started out building server environments and stuff like that, and I'm kind of the only guy now that codes, and we're looking for kind of help. So any help we can get in that area, anybody that wants to partner with us, anybody that wants to do some type of freelancing work with us, we're looking for people. So uh, kind of do the call out. Uh, that's Jessica, she's the creative director. Um, we're looking for a particular brand of crazy. Uh, both in our clients and what we work with. So kind of do a shout out for that. And whoever wants to talk to us, uh, come to either to me or Jessica. You can also come to me if it's after tonight. And I will totally pass it along because I adore these two. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So really quickly, you guys are being really lame with Twitter. I'm just saying. I've had like five people. What in the hell, guys? Oh, we have iPhone chargers. Seriously. Like, where? <laughs> where? Over here. Let's go. All right. So, David's wrapping up the top. As he's wrapping up the top, I'm paying attention to Twitter. Um, I also, if you did not get a ticket, I need you to raise your hand now. Okay, I got just one. Okay, two. Okay, awesome. I will give you guys tickets here in just in a second. Um, because then. So McLean's awesome t-shirt is our newest uh, cloud space t-shirt. That is one of the giveaways. And a book and three swag bags. So those are also being given away on top of code pen swag. That's what you're tweeting about. Good. Yeah, that's right, guys. Um, so I decided to tell CodePen that I'm doing a talk using CodePen. As you might notice, I'm not going to be using any slides. Instead, I'm going to be using this really cool professor mode link on Copen. So if you could all just copy that down, then you could go see it. I'm actually going to tweet it out. So you could either follow the hashtag or find me at David K. Piano and follow me and stuff if you want. All right, so today we're going to be talking about UI animations. And instead of giving a presentation on it, I'm actually going to live code one uh, animation that I thought was really cool. And while I'm doing this, we're going to be learning about transitions, animations, and different types of ways that you could use SAS to efficiently create UI animations. So we're going to be animating this button here. And by the way, if you guys clicked the professor mode link, you'll be taken to this page where you could see what I'm doing in live time. And you could open the chat and tell me how much this sucks or whatever, whatever you guys want. And I'm going to be making this bigger. All right, so 
going to be animating this button. Simple, right? I took my animation from, let me find it, this really cool animation concept done by Fantasy Interactive with this button over here. So let's see what they did. OK, opens up a pop-up. And then it does a whole bunch of cool stuff. Have you guys seen this before? No, really? OK, I highly encourage you to check out Fantasy Interactive. They're at f-i.com. They do a lot of really cool animation advertising concepts like this. And this is what we're actually going to try to create today. However, it's a lot of lines of code, so I'm going to cheat a little. Hopefully, that's OK with you guys. All right, so first step in, our cre in creating our UI animation is understanding that the best way to think about an animation is point A to point B. You have the beginning and the end. And everything in between is just the transition from point A to point B. So with that in mind, first thing you want to do is set up your HTML structure. So if you saw in the animation, there's five different pages. Here's the first one. It's short, so I'll play it again. Here's the second page, third page, fourth page, and the fifth page. All right, so let's say that your designer, who's awesome enough to use Adobe After Effects or whatever to create cool animations like this, and say, hey, can you make this for me and animate it? Um, you'll probably hate your designer, but that's OK. Yeah, you never do. First thing you would do, create the HTML views. So from the five pages that I talked about, we have page one. Cool. So far, so good. Right? We could change the numbers. Now, over here, I did a little bit of JavaScript so I could have the previous number and the next number. So that's why it looks a little uh, screwed up right now. Second page. OK. Looks just like the mocks even though the mocks are animated. Third page right here, and you could click and choose. I got lazy with the icons, which is why you saw duplicates there. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> Fourth page. Um, and in order to not get sued by FI, I changed humans to goats so that it's more of a goat clinic rather than a human clinic. Sorry, we have a bit of our JavaScript meetup that is a total insight created <laughs> because of this one and that one and the orange stickers. Yeah. We like goats. And this is <laughs> finally the fifth page. By the way, the iPhone is pure CSS too. All you have to do is do a border radius and whatever. It's not too hard. All right, so let's animate this. As I said, I'm going to cheat. All right, so first thing we're going to do is talk about the difference between transitions and animations. The best way to uh, determine the difference is transitions are really, you're going from some sort of indeterminate state to another indeterminate state. So when you give an element a transition, that means that whether you're going from opacity 0 to opacity 1 or changing color, transition will just take whatever you know, is thrown at it and transition from uh, basically whatever, indeterminate states, which is why I'm saying whatever. Animations, on the other hand, have a defined point A to point B. So a good candidate for transitions would be the buttons, first of all. So what I'm going to do is take, this is sort of like a cooking show, where at the end I'm going to be like, uh, I made it in advance, so here you go. <laughs> All right. Who here has worked with SAS? Raise of hands. Most of you. Good. Even if you haven't, less, it's with variables, it's sort of the same thing, except instead of using at, you use a dollar sign, sort of like PHP. 
except that SAS doesn't pretend to be a real language. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right. Can you all see the CSS screen? Fine. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. Can everyone see it fine? All right. I'll take that as a yes, I think. All right. I'm adding three animation settings, and that's really all we need. Animation slow, I'm storing the slow duration that I want. So this is going to be a little bit more than half of a second. And I also want a fast animation duration. So I'm doing that to a quarter of a second right there. And for the animation easing, I have a custom cubic bezier, however you pronounce that. And you could find these. I didn't pull these numbers, by the way. You could find these on easings.net, where you could just choose whichever easing you think looks awesome. The default ones get a little bit lackluster and boring, which include linear, ease and out, stuff like that. But some of these are really, really cool. You have elastic easings. So I encourage you, when you're working with your animations, play around, see which one of these look nice and feel nice. So I chose this one, I think. I'm going to pretend that this was the one I chose. Ease and out quint. All right. We have our animation settings. Now we're going to add the transitions, if I can find them. All right. Here we go. I'm going to create a lot of space here. And I'm going to create three placeholders. If you don't know what a placeholder is, it's sort of like a fake abstract class where you could reuse it by extending it into your selector. Um, and that's what we're going to do here because we have a lot of properties. I could use a mixin, but uh, the number of properties in our style sheet would just explode if I did that. So I'm going to use extend for this. I have an animate fast where the animation duration is the fast duration, and an animate slow where we have the slow duration. Transition, I want all of my transitions to be fast, so I'm going to set the transition duration to fast and set all of the properties to transition. I took the easing function and put it inside the, um, I should probably put in transition too, so let's do transition either a timing function or an easy function. Anyway, animation easing. There we go. And animation fill mode both. That means that when you go from point A to point B, your element is going to, before the animation happens, keep all of the styles in A. And then once the animation happens, keep all of the styles in B. If you didn't have both, if you only had forwards or backwards, it would animate to B and then reverts right back to what it was before. Of course, we don't want that. OK. So let's make these buttons animate. And I hid my HTML. All right. Just copy over the HTML. All right, let's see what happens. No one is watching. Oh, all right. We have eight people watching the professor mode. That's pretty cool. There might be some off of live stream as well. We have a few people watching live right now. Oh, okay. All right, seven. I guess someone got bored. <laughs> 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 That's okay. <laughs> all right. Let's add a few more styles. So first thing we want to do. Remember the video that you know was literally five minutes ago, so hopefully you remember. It the pop-up thing expanded. A note on performance, the two best properties to animate in order to be performance are transforms and opacity. So we could use transforms for this to increase the scale from zero to one. Now we have to be mindful of doing this that the transform origin is right there. So that when you click, it looks like it's coming from the button rather than thin air. So that is right here. 
Trust me, if I typed this all out, you'd be here forever. And World of Beer closes sometime, so there is. Okay, I have keyframes pop over active. That does exactly what I said. It goes from transform scale zero to scale one. I'm extending animate slow because I want this to be and I'm taking that keyframe, pop over active, and I'm putting it in animation name. And of course, I have the transform origin set to top center so that it comes from right there. Pretty cool, huh? I'm going to pretend you guys are sort of impressed by that. There's more students, so they're impressed. All right. Yeah, they're telling their friends, and they're coming. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. OK, let's do a few animations on the first page. And we're just going to use that. OK. What we're going to do is animate this over here. Remember how I said I have a pre it disappeared. Oh. I have a previous hour. And OK, that's great. Code pen is being blocked. Caitlin, what did you do? I don't know. All right. We've been talking about this talk for a while. I block your stuff. That's sort of reason why this is happening. OK. I think it's working now. All right. Yeah, I think I'm just adding too much code for it to handle. All right. I have two animations now. Hour earlier and hour later. Hour earlier means the hour is going to go um, down, I think, whatever it did in the animation. Let's find out. All right, so when you click and the hour goes down, then yeah, you see how the hour goes down? So that's what the hour earlier animation is going to be. And in order to do that, I'm transforming again. Some of you might be uh, tempted to use the top property with position absolute or using a margin animation. Please don't do that because you are triggering layout, which means your animations aren't going to be that performant. So I'm uh, animating both the transform and the opacity. And so let's see what happens. OK, it still screws up. Ah, OK. Come on. OK, so this works just fine. There we go. Pretty cool, huh? So we do, we put the hour up. The hours go up because it's both transforming it so that the, tr the Y makes it shift up. And the opacity is going to 0, so it does this cool little fade out effect. And so if you think of animations in that way, they're not as complicated as they seem. So let's add the rest of the pages. And before we do that, we have to add the keyframes. My convention for keyframes is having both an active and an inactive transition or keyframe. Uh, let's see. Let's go down. There's a lot of code here. OK. So here's the animations I'm going to use. I'm going to use fade. And I call this fade active and fade inactive instead of fade in, fade out, just because I want to keep that naming convention. So fade active predictably goes from opacity 0 to opacity 1. And fade act inactive does the opposite. I have an animation called shift up down, which, when active, will bring something into view by pushing it up and setting the opacity to 1. And inactive, it would um, do the opposite. It would bring it down and make it fade out. I'm also doing slide up down, which is sort of the same thing, except instead of shifting a little bit, it shifts 100% of its height. And now I, I also have slide down up for doing the same thing, except coming into view, it slides down. And going out of view, it slides up. All right, let's apply this to all of our pages here. 
And don't worry, I'm going to go through this not really in too much depth because you don't have that much time. All right. Use JavaScript to trigger your animations. Don't try to use fancy CSS tricks. I'm completely guilty of this, but I'm using jQuery in here to, whenever I'm on a page, I set the page to active. And whenever I'm off a page, I set it to inactive. So over here, we have page one inactive. And let's take the week, for example. Uh, or actually, let's take the content. What I want for the contents to do is stay the same so that it has this cool little optical illusion where when the second page is coming in, it looks like the time is changing color. And then after that, I want it to fade out in the background. And that's what this animation delay here is. So let's see how that looks. Someone give me a time. How about? No, I mean oh. for here. <laughs> 7.30. Good job. OK. All right. So here's the optical illusion right here. Pretty cool, huh? These are actually two separate views, except that the first one is staying still while the other one is coming into view. And um, yeah. See that one more time because I put a bunch of other animations in there, including animating the header and the footer here. So, can anyone tell me which one of my animations was on the footer? Shift up, slide up, fade in. Shift up, yeah, there we go. Just come see me. After class. <laughs> OK. So going to the next view, um, now we have our icons. And if you notice, since we added the transition to here too, all we're doing is saying, when this checkbox is checked, change the background color to this dark blue. And it's doing it with a transition, which allows it to give that nice fading in effect of the color. And it also fades the contents to white. So when you click Next, uh, you have goats here, which are pretty cool. This goat, the picture is a little bit off. <laughs> and then let's explain this one real quick. All right, something is a little bit off. Let's just do this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. As you can see, we applied the animations using page active and page inactive to tell each of our elements to do one of our specified animations, whether it's shifting up, sliding up, or fading in. So we go to the next one. Of course, this slides up. That was a slide up animation. Transition is used for each of these records right here. And of course, transition is also used for this button over here. That way, it doesn't just go from blue to a lighter blue without a nice visual transition. And um, yep, there, that's better. Over here, this is a, probably the most complex part of the animation, just because we have to choreograph a lot of things at once. So the first thing that's happening is that page five is coming into view. Then there's a short delay. Then the iPhone comes into view. Then there's another delay. And then the iPhone notification comes to view. Now, syncing up these animations is not as difficult as it seems. All you have to do is play around with the page or the uh, animation delay property. And since I already have variables for my animations, all I have to do is first find the page. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of code here. All right, let's do this. Page five, since it's on the last page. Uh, not that one. All right, here we go. 
Here's all the things that are animating on page five. First, we have the info, which is this little text snippet that says, add your appointments to the calendar. And all we're doing is extending our animate slow pseudo class to say we want this to ease in slow. And we're giving it the animation of shift up, down, active, which means it's going to shift up and fade in at the same time. The iPhone is going to come in the same way, except it's going to slide up, up and we're giving it an animation delay of animation slow. The reason we're giving it the animation delay of slow is because for everything to come to the page initially takes that duration, which is a little bit more than half a second. Now, for the animation to show up, we have to wait for two things. Number one, we have to wait for the page to finally show everything, animation slow. And then we have to wait for the iPhone to come up, which is the animation slow again. So over here, as you could guess, animation delay is animation slow times two. So goes page, iPhone, iPhone notification. And then you get your appointment with GOAT, which I could imagine is not a very good doctor. All right, so I'm going to be putting this up on code and probably tomorrow or so just because I want to you know, sort of finalize it. But this is an example of how you could easily do UI animations using SAS to help you. And the thing is, you really don't even need to use SAS as much as it pains me to say it because everything we're doing is very thinly related to SAS. All of these you could just copy and paste in your CSS if you feel like doing vanilla CSS, or you could include as a mix-in in less if you want to. So the key things to take away from this are animations can have two different states, active and inactive, and organizing your animations that way makes it really easy to add these animations to your UI uh, components. And um, we also talked about the difference between transitions and animations and synchronizing animations. So does anyone have any questions? Why aren't you following Jason Sansmarita? Should I? Oh, holy <laughs> crap. Shocker <laughs> <laughs> mode. Where? Oh. oh, I just missed it. Jason Santamaria. I, sh I, I don't know who this guy is, but I'm going to follow him just for you. <laughs> ah, cool. So this is maybe somewhat unrelated, but I saw that you had a SAS implementation of underscore and Lodash. Yeah, sorry. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what use cases have you like found for that? Because I've never really needed like really like robust. Um, oh wait, just kidding. Right, um, hold on, let's find it. What this is, is, um, I mean, I sort of explained it at the beginning where it's basically up to you to decide what you want to do with SAS Dash. And for people who don't know, you could do a lot of things with SAS. You could also go a little crazy and make complex functions with it. I decided to take Lodash and move it into SAS, SAS and we got SAS Dash. Um, this is more for being able to organize your data in an efficient way. A lot of people have themes, color palettes, where they have maps within maps, and then getting the color, manipulating variables is not the easiest thing to do. And with Lodash, or at least Lodash syntax, you get that expressiveness to be able to easily do things you want to um, I promise I'll come up with use cases. It was sort of just a personal challenge that took me two months. But yeah, so if you guys want to check that out. Um, good question, though. No, sorry. I, I saw it on your GitHub, and I was like, oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, could you further what you just asked to, to modularize the code a little bit so it's not so heavy in there? Uh, yeah, in CodePen, no, okay. because you have one single view in CodePen, and it is always much better to um, modularize your code, which, thanks, that was a plug. Here's another plug. I have a series on scotch.io called <laughs> Aesthetic SAS. 
And uh, number two is coming out soon. The first one actually talks about architecture and style organization, where you could organize components both within your entire project and within each individual component. And I sort of show you how to do that in there. So go on Scotch, look for those articles. Lots of plugins today. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions, guys? If not, well, you guys can definitely pick his brain while we're drinking beer. OK. So that being said, you, by the way, do not forget your phone, my dear. It's no plugged in over here. Um, are you done talking or give away? I'm done, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, time for me to end the live stream. Thank you.